Watson, or today's webinar is Lessons Learned on Helicopter History. Uh, it's going to be a very, very, very interesting webinar, I believe. Let's jump right into it. Our panelist is today is Dr. Roger Connor. He's the curator of Vertical uh, Flight Collection at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Vertical Flight uh, Collection includes helicopters, gyroplanes, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft of all kinds. It's a fascinating collection. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's from Virginia Tech and holds a master in arts from museum studies from the George Washington University and a master's uh, from George Mason University, where he also received his doctorate. Uh, he is an experienced fix, fixed wing pilot with over 4,000 hours of commercial time and uh, 3,000 hours of dual uh, instruction time. I did not get the slide in, but uh, Jim Viola, our president and CEO, is also joining us today. For those of you who uh, have not been with us in a while, obviously we have not been with you. Uh, webinar how-tos. We do appreciate your questions. We do appreciate your comments. If you do want to ask Dr. Connor a question, please use the question module. Uh, that's gonna be either on the bottom of the side of your screen. Uh, we will try to pay attention to the chat function, but it's not the primary focus for the questions. And so we wanna make sure that if you do submit a question, we do wanna try and get it answered. If there's a lot of questions, we may not be able to answer them all today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will make the recording available on YouTube and on our website just as quickly as possible. Usually that's uh, the next afternoon, but it could be as long as Monday, depending on how long it takes for things to get rendered. So now with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Jim Viola, our president and CEO. It's just a little slow also, I guess. Uh, maybe out of practice here. From, uh, uh, we've all gone through that period this summer. So how's everything going? Do, do you have me today? <laughs> You're here. Uh, we see you. All right. Great. So I just uh, touch base on and uh, set up uh, the doctor here. You know, throughout the history of helicopters, you know, designers and manufacturers have promoted the idea of the public of, of not only us around here, but but the people that we fly around. Uh, the idea of using rotorcraft for routine travel. I mean, it's certainly is something that even Robinson's had done with the R44 and the R22 back to Frank Robinson. And the shuttles that would commute you from home to work and the idea of, of basically a helicopter replacing a car. You know, with that, you know, it would reduce the amount of time that, you know, depending on what part of the country or what part of the world you're in, you know, the, the time of spent on the roads. And that's still the object of today of trying to get vertical flight to reduce the time uh, that it takes you to go between point A to point B. And certainly the roads, as they get congested more and more, people are looking for the, uh, the ability to go vertically and get to the city. So over the years, there have been many commercial operators who tried to do that exact thing, try to do shuttle flights. One of them was Pan Am, the New York Airways, and also Los Angeles helicopters. They looked at the concept of using, uh, of using that to, to be able to move a lot of people. And then I think you're probably here today, you know, the concept had a couple of flaws with, with accidents early on. And, and a lot of times then it just stopped the whole thing of going, on, of going on. And same thing today, we're still trying to get back to rooftops. You know, the accidents that occurred before, you know, back when you carried fuel. And now if we look at the sustainability and we look at the EV tolls, we have different challenges as we get into the future to try to get those concepts working again. Even in the 80s, Donald Trump used uh, two Chinooks to move passengers from New York City to his casino in New Jersey. So today, there's a handful of operators still working, still trying to do shuttle flights. Um, and you know, you'll see some of those things in some of our operators that do uh, 135 demand. But why aren't there more flights out there? And, and what do we think we'll see in the future? Well, if you're going to look at into the future, you always have to go back and, and look at what you know what happened in the past. What is the history? So, really look forward to, to seeing uh, what we're going to have here today, because one of the things that really turned around was in the logging. You know, you see a lot of helicopters using logging. Until that really started, uh, some of the bigger aircraft showed up to help that logging. Like when Columbia uh, helicopters started using the Boeing 107s or the Chinooks, essentially because those other commuter airlines failed, then they had the tool to start logging, which was very successful for helicopters. So as we move into advanced air mobility, 
now there's another campaign for public acceptance and community compatibility to be able to try to do that very same thing again is being able to commute via vertical flight and so i'm really excited i think we've got a lot of good things coming and our webinar today looks back at the rotorcraft concepts that may have worked or not worked and then how do we learn from these areas of the past and the best methods of not repeating the same mistakes so let us get started today if you've ever had the opportunity to get um, to the location of the national Mar mall or out by dallas the udvar hazy center you know what an amazing collection of historical uh, rotorcraft and aviation uh, are in those buildings. Uh, and so Udar Hazy is the center home to the majority of the helicopters. So definitely have to get out to Dulles. And the person in charge of those is Dr. Roger Connor, who's with us today and uh, really look forward. So I'd like to welcome you if you'd bring your camera online. And then, uh, you know, you must be excited uh, with not only where we've been, but um, but you know the future as we got uh, a vehicle now on Mars, uh, so we've got interplanetary stuff going on. Uh, so I'm really excited, and I know you are too. So I'll let you go ahead and kick it off. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Dan. Uh, much appreciated. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, you know, it's uh, I can remember when I was a 13 year old uh, going uh, to my uh, first HAI convention because uh, I had just seen Blue Thunder and. Uh, you know, helicopters were clearly what I wanted to be involved with, and so I, I got my dad to drag me down to New Orleans to uh, to see the um, HAI convention that year, uh, and it's you know it's been rotorcraft ever since. Um, what I'd like to do today is to share a little bit about uh, one of my uh, research projects, which has uh, been about the uh, how the U.S. government has uh, supported rotorcraft development and some of the ways that that kind of reflects uh, both the strengths and weaknesses of, of government policy as it relates to technology. And so what we're gonna look at today is essentially the first iteration of urban air mobility. Uh, so for those of you that uh, are familiar with the Uber Elevates program as it uh, kicked off in 2017 and then went through uh, a couple of very prominent public forums. I know I had a chance to attend the one here in Washington uh, just before COVID hit. And uh, they were fascinating if, if anybody got to go to those before uh, Uber uh, dumped its Elevate program. But uh, there was, there was a, a, a fascinating vision uh, that Uber put forward. And it was... Uh, to, to my mind, at least, it was a bit more about infrastructure than it was even aircraft or operations. Uh, they were quite fascinated with uh, the idea of various dual-use uh, heliport facilities or vertiport facilities that uh, could be used to support their ground-based infrastructure as well as uh, serve as a platform for launching um, regional or uh, urban air services. And when I was at, at Elevate, listening to the various speakers talk about these proposals, uh, I looked back on some of the historical research that I was doing and uh, seeing how uh, some of the past lessons and, and moments uh, lined up with those experiences. And I think that it's a, it's a useful uh, comparison to, to look at these things in parallel. Uh, because there's a lot of the similar concerns. And regardless of how things shake out here in the near future in terms of the certification process or even the, the market basis for uh, EV tolls going forward, I think there's a lot of uh, other lessons that come out of uh, the nation's attempt in the 1950s and 60s, especially to introduce helicopter airline service, scheduled helicopter airline service into the United States. Uh, one of those lessons I think that will really come through is just how important the military relationship is uh, to innovation and essentially the, the sponsorship of this technology. And I, I bring that up especially because of Agility Prime and some of the other DoD programs that are now starting to interface with the EV toll project. So as I go through this presentation today, uh, try and keep that in mind. Uh, so what we're really talking about today are four different companies. Uh, so there were three, three of the four companies were subsidized, federally subsidized helicopter airlines. And there was a fourth, San Francisco, uh, Oakland helicopter airlines that uh, was unsubsidized. Um, 
SFO was the the last one of these to go into service. It started in 1961. The other ones uh, had the roots in the late 40s or early 50s. Uh, by far the largest of these was Los Angeles uh, Airways, which uh, ran from uh, about 1947 uh, to the very early 1970s. Uh, they operated a range of aircraft uh, through the 1950s. These were exclusively uh, single engine pistons. Uh, and then uh, they began to acquire, for the most part, uh, twin turbines in the 1960s. Um, this is important because even from the outset, almost from the outset, uh, it was understood that these operations could only be uh, economically self-sufficient uh, with the advent of that twin turbine technology. So this was something that was sought all through the 50s. And when it finally came in in the 60s, unfortunately, it turned out that these operations were not as profitable as they uh, had been hoped for. Uh, as I mentioned, Los Angeles uh, was probably the largest and, and most uh, significant of these operations, uh, certainly covered the largest geographic area. It was certainly the most ambitious in terms of numbers of stops. It was the one most uh, closely associated with post office operations uh, for mail carriage. And uh, this uh, route structure simplified down a little bit later to about 12 stops, but uh, it was it was quite a significant operation. New York Airways was certainly one of the more famous ones since they were, uh, for a few years at least, flying off of the roof of the Pan Am building. Uh, and so this was a fairly successful route that lasted all the way until 1979. Um, and there, were, of course, we see the, uh, the Pan Am uh, rooftop landings made with the uh, Vertol 107s. The uh, landing facility there on the Pan Am building was only operable for, I think, about 26 months in the 1960s. So from December of uh, of uh, 65 to, uh, uh, I think, February of 68. Uh, and it was shut down uh, for the same reason that we see uh, heliports and bird ports being shut down today, which was essentially community uh, concerns over noise and safety. Um, and uh, that community pushback. It was reopened in uh, 1977. Uh, and then unfortunately, within just a few months of it reopening in 1977, uh, there was a nasty uh, fatal accident on the rooftop that, that led to its uh, permanent shutdown. And we'll see that just in just a minute. Uh, SFO, again, our unsubsidized uh, airline, uh, helicopter airline service. This one started... Uh, exclusively with turbines. So it started with the uh, Sikorsky S-62 single uh, in 1961, and then eventually moved on to adding uh, S-61s uh, at, uh, later on. Uh, they even ran uh, Bell hovercraft uh, for a period as well. Uh, this operation was the longest uh, or longest lasting. It, it stayed in service until about the mid 80s. Uh, that uh, operation was really undone by the fact that uh, uh, road service in the in the Bay Area, particularly the bridging of the the southern part of the uh, the Bay, uh, reduced demand so that the uh, operation couldn't stay in service. There was also Chicago Helicopter Airways in the 1950s. This was probably the most successful operation, uh, but it it suffered pretty significantly in the 1960s and never really made the transition to to turbine aircraft at least as uh, far as scheduled service goes. Um, but this is really the the big story here. Um, so we see, uh, you know, a very rapid rise in, in passenger service, and it reached its apex uh, between 1966 and 1968, when over 1 million passengers were carried annually in the United States on scheduled helicopter uh, routes. So this was a, a big deal. It uh, uh, these were significant operations. Um, you know that's that's a lot of people being carried by helicopters. But as you can see, uh, just as quickly as it started, it uh, it fell off quite quickly. And there are some pretty significant reasons for that. Uh, the primary reason for it uh, was that these operations, as we mentioned, were uh, at least three of the four were heavily subsidized by the federal government. Uh, these subsidies often ran to at least 50%. Um, in some cases, the uh, passenger subsidy, uh, if you basically added up 
you know, take take the full federal subsidies, uh, including the mail subsidies, divided by the number of passengers. And what you find is the U.S. government was subsidizing each passenger at a rate of about one hundred and thirty dollars uh, in today's money. Um, so kind of astounding. Uh, that's why this program was not particularly popular in Congress. Uh, and it's it's one of the more interesting aspects is why Congress was willing to subsidize uh, helicopter transport at that level for that long a period of time. And the short answer is that uh, it was fairly easy for advocates of the helicopter airlines to approach Congress uh, through the 1950s and, and into the early 1960s and argue that the helicopter airlines were a proving ground for military technologies. Essentially what happens is that uh, during the early part of the Cold War, uh, the defense budget in the United States was so heavily committed towards uh, developing jet aircraft for nuclear delivery, ballistic missiles, all that sort of thing, that some of the basics, including helicopter development, were not seen as being adequately covered. And helicopter subsidies, whether that was uh, Civil Aeronautics Board subsidies uh, for passenger carriage or uh, post office subsidies for mail carriage were seen as a way of putting money into the hands of helicopter manufacturers uh, to improve the reliability, maintainability, and design of aircraft that were dual use in military service. And so we see these arguments coming up uh, almost on a yearly basis uh, before Congress. And so there is a, a very close association between the rise of these helicopter airlines and what's happening in the United States in the Cold War. And the reason that these subsidies are cut off in 1965, of course, is that with the heavy U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War and Defense Department appropriations in support of that war, you know, uh, uh, contributing to thousands and thousands of helicopter orders, uh, that uh, federal subsidy for helicopter airline service is no longer seen as significant. And so it, it's essentially cut off in 1965. And naturally, as soon as it's it's cut off, um, there are a number of problems in service that crop up. And as Jim alluded to, there were a series of accidents that occur um, fairly soon after. So we get to get into some of the, the detail of this, we can see here uh, that the 50s were a very a uh, good period of time, even though these services were operating single engine pistons, uh, they were doing a fairly good job of expanding the route structure and uh, making their, their profit primarily on the mail revenue and the um, uh, uh, freight uh, uh, service that they were operating. Uh, this is a little bit later. So this is 1964. This is kind of as the services were reaching their uh, approaching their peak in the mid 1960s, but you can see that uh, by this point, Los Angeles Airways is certainly the the dominant operator uh, at that time. Um, this statement was put out by the FAA in 1960, and it basically is a summation of you know what what ultimately doomed the helicopter airlines. Uh, so the FAA certainly knew. Uh, that even when the twin turbines, the, the S61Ls and the Vertol 107s were coming in, that they were not going to be profitable. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this was in direct contradiction of the testimony that was, was uh, coming before Congress at the time, which said, oh yeah, once we get these twin turbines in service, well, we should be profitable and we can start uh, tapering off the subsidies. And of course, that's not what happens. Um, but in addition to the 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 simple uh, profitability of of the routes, the other factor that needs to be considered is that even as they acquired larger aircraft that were more efficient, they were never meeting uh, their load requirements. So the the uh, the load factor on these aircraft was very rarely exceeding fifty percent, and as you can see. Uh, even though the ability to meet a satisfactory load factor was there, they just were not selling the seats necessary to uh, make these operations sustainable. 
And so that's another kind of critical factor on this was the, the market was just really not well understood by these companies. Uh, and so even as they're unable to fill uh, the capacity of their, their new twin turbines, they were already hoping for some super helicopter by the late 1960s, you know, something that would do nearly 200 miles an hour with 65 seats. Um, the argument that was uh, often put forward at the time was, well, even if we have to keep it subsidized, there are a lot of other parts of the transportation sector that are subsidized, whether that's mass transit or different other types of airline services. Congress subsidizes a lot of different uh, types of transport. Uh, so why not have it be the helicopter airlines? And this, I think, was a failure of the uh, helicopter airlines and the industry to really make the case uh, that they were doing something other than serving just a very elite market segment. So while uh, Igor Sikorsky and others had really built their business on the idea that the helicopter would one day be able to serve uh, you know, a very broad part of the community, uh, the reality was it was only seen that you know it was it was basically the wealthy that were utilizing helicopter services. And uh, so by that measure, you know it was an elite activity that was being subsidized by taxpayers, and that it was better to uh, put subsidies towards other forms of transport that had a much broader uh, impact and were not so uh, exclusive. As I mentioned, uh, and Jim mentioned the, uh, helicopter airlines had a pretty horrific series of accidents, uh, the most notable of which were in 1968. So Los Angeles Airways, uh, beginning in 1955, had started a service between LAX and uh, Disneyland in Anaheim, and that was one of their more profitable passenger routes. And those, those kind of high passenger numbers in the mid-1960s were largely a part of that, and they were operating their uh, fleet of five S61Ls uh, on that route. Unfortunately, in 1968, there were, in the span of just three months, there were uh, two horrific mid-air um, uh, structural uh, incidents involving the rotor systems of, the, of two of the S61Ls that uh, took the lives of nearly 50 passengers and crew combined. And unfortunately, this one might think that once the subsidies ended, that maintenance fell off and that these were a maintenance issue. That was actually not the case. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It had more to do with the fact that the S61L was simply a new design uh, and that the metallurgic, and in many cases, the metallurgical aspects of uh, components were not as well understood as they are today. And so it, one accident was deemed to be a, you know, a casting error in the, in, in the spindle uh, another, uh, you know, uh, the, the other accident was due to a, a damper issue that was really not un well understood at the time. So uh, neither fact, neither of these these uh, significant fatal accidents were blamed uh, on the air crew or the operator uh, as a function of, of, of maintenance. Nonetheless, uh, they were a significant um, factor in the public turning away from uh, an interest in flying on those those routes, uh, particularly in Los Angeles. Um, so there was, of course, the accident on the roof of the Pan Am building in 1977. Uh, this one was also somewhat bizarre. In this case, uh, the aircraft was on the ground uh, in a um, idling condition, and uh, the one of the main gears simply failed. So a, a structural element uh, again. Uh, presumably a metallurgical flaw caused the uh, the landing gear to, to simply fail and the aircraft rolled over on its side uh, and unfortunately killed four uh, passengers and then a, a pedestrian on the ground below was killed by uh, one of the rotor blades as it separated. Uh, and that certainly uh, was effectively the, the nail in the coffin for New York Airways uh, and, and more or less ended their service. Um, so clearly uh, a pretty serious case of negative publicity. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the grim story of what happened to the helicopter airlines. But I thought it'd be uh, interesting to kind of go back a little bit and look at the vision of how 
uh, these helicopter airlines kind of came to be in the first place, uh, which I think you'll see a lot of parallels with the uh, urban air mobility and the EV toll community. And I think it's it's interesting to see how some of those things played out. And we can also take a look at some of the things that maybe were overlooked then that are perhaps overlooked now as well. Um, so the idea of uh, an urban air mobility is certainly more than 110 years old. We can go back here to 1912 and see a, a very similar concept being put forward uh, with rooftop landings. Uh, but by the 1930s even, uh, the idea of using helicopters, uh, passenger helicopters specifically, to move between a urban center and then an outlying airport, and even in the 1930s, it was understood that airplanes were only going to get bigger and need longer runways, and that they were going to be further and further out from the urban core, and that some means of rapidly connecting uh, the urban core with the outlying uh, airport uh, was was necessary, and so helicopters were even seen by the mid 1930s as as an uh, opportunity. Um, this is a pretty good illustration of that. This is from uh, the Futurama exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair, which uh, General Motors had sponsored, and uh, this was kind of their vision for future cities. But they put vertiports in there uh, as part of it. We see an intermodal hub, so we've got uh, commuter rail lines coming in. Uh, with the with different vertiport facilities and aircraft. Um, and so the, by the late 30s, this was certainly an idea of, uh, hey, maybe future cities are going to utilize this type of capability. Uh, and at the same time that that's happening, the post office is funding some uh, trial experiments. They're looking at using rotorcraft in the form of the autogyro uh, to move mail between uh, the local airports, and then the downtown mail, mail sorting facilities. Uh, this culminated in a year-long trial on the roof of the uh, uh, Philadelphia Post Office, uh, and they ran autogyros between Camden and the uh, post office roof on a daily basis, did that for a year. It did not prove to be a particularly profitable uh, experiment. It showed that you could uh, deliver the mail more quickly that way, but uh, the cost uh, versus, you know, surface, uh, uh, basically a truck uh, alternative, uh, it was nowhere near competitive. And of course, then uh, helicopter development is really pushed by the war. And so Igor Sikorsky, uh, as you probably well know, uh, was able to to bring uh, his, his designs to practical fruition because of a rapid influx of military funds. And of course, even to this day, we still see military spending uh, out, outstripping civil by a factor of about 10 to 1. Um, Sikorsky was not really allowed by the military uh, for at least the uh, through 1942 uh, to, to talk about what he was doing with uh, his, his uh, helicopter ambition. So he was told to, uh, to keep it quiet in terms of promoting the potential post-war civil applications of the helicopter, that starts to change in early 1943. And one of the first things that Igor Sikorsky does is partner with uh, Greyhound and with uh, the Raymond Lowy company. Raymond Lowy was a, a famous industrial designer, but they started to put together a vision for what a post-war helicopter transport would look like uh, and one that Greyhound specifically could use as a way of uh, connecting its its different facilities together uh, by air, and so this this concept is really, I think, when the um, helicopter airline model starts to to kick off in a significant form. Now, this was done fairly quietly; it wasn't uh, publicly advertised, and it's not really till the, the middle of 1943 that Sikorsky is truly allowed by the Army to uh, take the wraps off the helicopter. Uh, incidentally, uh, this this design did progress fairly far, at least on paper, uh, through the end of the war. So this was a, a 14 passenger design. Um, so the, the big moment, though, comes in uh, June of 1943. And this is when Sikorsky is really allowed to show what he's done up to this point in a very public way. This attracts huge attention. So just as... Uh, Uber's uh, Elevate announcement 2017 
was a seminal moment in the uh, development of EV toll aircraft, it, something that really opened the flood, floodgates to venture capital. The same was true of this moment in June of 1943 when Sikorsky came out with this article. It it kind of blew a lot of people away, and a lot of people instantly were told that you know not only is the helicopter here but that it's going to be available at costs that are essentially equivalent to a uh, family automobile, uh, that it's going to be easy to operate, uh, that they're going to be everywhere post-war. So uh, immediately there, there begins to be a helicopter bubble. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, several dozens of companies, actually more than several dozens of companies are formed to build uh, helicopters. There are a number, uh, I think there's within two months of the publishing of this this particular article there are 26 applications to the civil aeronautics board for operation of air taxi and and bus aerial bus services using helicopters and this is in august of 1943 so even before there's any sort of uh, certificated aircraft available and so there were over 1600 towns and cities that had some sort of uh proposed service attached to the, all those different applications. So it was a, a kind of a mind-bogglingly uh, massive undertaking at that moment to, to build on this idea. And you know, here we can see what Sikorsky was proposing, very much this kind of backyard to office rooftop model of service. And we can see that, you know, here, here's a very famous, uh, Alex Tremulous, a very famous uh, Detroit um, uh, Illustrator, somebody that was uh, designing the new model cars for uh, the the big car manufacturers in Detroit, and he sees that uh, Sikorsky article immediately, you know, draws up, you know, what's the flying version of that? What's the helicopter version of of the car of tomorrow? And uh, we can see that, you know, in August of 1943, um, you know, here's here's a typical proposal: somebody that was a a big developer in Atlanta that was proposing essentially a forerunner of the shopping mall was was putting a rooftop air service on there. Um, so a lot a lot of big uh, ideas under development. Grant Greyhound continues to to work on its idea even into the early post war years. The reality, of course, was that the equipment available never matched. Uh, those visions. So the first aircraft really available for uh, under civil certification was the Bell 47, which was a single passenger aircraft and uh, certainly not suitable for the types of services that were being proposed. So really uh, what does happen though is Clarence Boleyn, who is the founder of Los Angeles Airways, a former army aircraft mechanic, uh, and then a, a uh, early entrant into the air, uh, fixed wing airline field, he he sees the value in the helicopter with all all of these proposals that are taking place in the mid nineteen uh, during World War II, and very quickly proposes to the post office that uh, he use helicopters uh, for an airmail service. And he, in fact, in his initial proposal, he's working with Sikorsky, who's proposed a. Uh, uh, a single place, uh, very um, very lightweight, uh, what he calls a scout, a roto scout, which was intended to be a, a rapid airmail delivery helicopter. So this is uh, kind of an interesting uh, early Sikorsky design that you don't see too much, but one that was very much tied to this early model of, of airmail development. Uh, the post office is actually pretty excited about this, even though the autogyro airmail uh, concept didn't pay out. Uh, they are uh, willing to look at helicopter mail uh, in the late 1940s, and the Army Air Rescue Service actually uh, participates in what's known as Project Mail, which is an effort to uh, directly support uh, these proposed airmail routes uh, with DOD aircraft and using them in in, uh, in place of a certificate certificated aircraft while they have yet to become available. And so we can kind of see this this vision is uh, is very popularized and the accomplishments that are taking place in 1947 uh, get a lot of attention. But uh, by uh, middle of 1947, uh, Los Angeles Airways is able to get its certification and I start operating the, the S S51 in um, commercial mail service. 
And so here we can see uh, the initial route structure that was used. Again, fairly ambitious uh, for the time. And so certainly this was, uh, as it kicked off, a, a highly successful program. And we get some sense of what was happening here with the, the mail coming off of transcontinental flights uh, into LAX. And certainly uh, this effort was a huge feather in the cap for uh, Sikorsky. And as I had mentioned before, even at the outset, it was understood fairly well that this model of development was only really going to pay off when passengers could be carried and when they were carried on twin turbine design. So through uh, the 1950s, this is the model that uh, everyone's hoping for and that is seen as, as the definitive answer to the problem of making these helicopter airlines profitable. Um, and I also mentioned that the, the military uh, kind of comes in and, and really defines this process. And of course, what's happened is that in 1949, there's all manner of things that are kicking off the Cold War. We have the uh, Berlin airlift, the fall of China, the testing of the first Soviet atomic bomb, uh, followed very quickly by uh, the uh, North Korean invasion of South Korea in the middle of 1950. And so just as all of these different helicopter airlines are putting their proposals before uh, different review boards for the post office and civil aeronautics board, um, what we see happen is that, first of all, the post office has finally reached the conclusion that it, its subsidies are no longer appropriate for helicopter operations. The post office basically says these, these services have not been shown to be profitable in any way uh, relative to other types of, of mail transport. Even though it's moving the mail faster in certain spots, uh, it's, it's just way too expensive. It's usually three or four times as expensive as, as doing it any other way. Uh, and so we'd like to end our services. Uh, our, our subsidies of, of the uh, helicopter mail carriage. And of course, that would have been a, a fairly fatal blow for most of these proposals because they had not yet gotten to the point where they had the aircraft capable of passenger service and nor did they have the approval for passenger service. So the, the post office money was the only thing keeping these operations alive. Uh, but just at the very moment that the post office was coming in saying that it wanted to cease all operations uh, relative to, to helicopter mail carriage, uh, the other as associated interests, primarily the military, uh, step in and say, okay, we, we actually need these capabilities because we need a testing ground uh, to show, you know, the maintainability of aircraft. We, we need to improve the, um, uh, you know, overhaul uh, uh, the, the TBOs, uh, on, on different components. For instance, the Bell 47, when it first went into service, uh, TBO on the uh, gearbox of a Bell 47B was 25 hours. So uh, things, things were not good early on in terms of the maintainability and operability of, of the helicopter models then present. So the helicopter airlines were very much seen as the venue for solving some of these problems as uh, the military was coming to terms with new applications in its, in its own service. Of course, civil defense was another issue. So as uh, American cities were now perceived to be under atomic threat, and this was a, a particularly uh, famous magazine uh, cover from the uh, middle of 1950 that really uh, amplified the fears of atomic attack in the U.S., um, you know, before this, it was a, it was an abstract. Once this thing hit the newsstands, uh, people, uh, were, were literally, uh, terrified, um, of what the potential was. So civil defense all of a sudden becomes a huge issue. So we see, uh, a lot of statements like this, uh, you know, the, and this is coming out just after that magazine was published. Um, but we see here that, you know, helicopters are now seen as a potentially critical way of, of dealing with it. So the helicopter airlines are seen, th those subsidies are seen as a way of providing the, the aircraft that would be available for these civil defense services. So uh, it's a further justification then for the continuing of the post office subsidies, even over its own objections. Um, and what's interesting is that, uh, 
there's uh, even an a uh, um, an instrument uh, flight um, standards aspect to this. So Los Angeles Airways is is able to get a an emergency IFR authorization for its uh, S fifty ones in nineteen fifty. Um, basically for like a you know, 15 minute period, essentially. So you could do like a, you know, an emergency uh, uh, IFR penetration and escape uh, if you needed to. And this is allowing them to fly night flights over Los Angeles uh, at the beginning of the Korean War. And what happens is that the uh, Air Force sees this because there's not really anybody else that's doing anything with night or instrument flying with helicopters at that moment, of course, they need that capability in Korea. Uh, they basically come to uh, LA Airways and say, we need to train our pilots uh, by allowing them to fly your mail runs over the uh, skies of Los Angeles at night uh, and in instrument conditions. And this is kind of interesting. We see Joseph Barrett uh, there on the left. And so he becomes the very first presidential helicopter pilot. He's the uh, uh, flies uh, President Eisenhower in 1957 with the helicopter that we have out at the Uber Hansi Center. Um, and then on the right is uh, Boyd Kesselring, who actually goes on to become a uh, one of the uh, principals at uh, Los Angeles Airways after leaving the, uh, the Air Force. He was also in the first uh, class of helicopter pilots uh, in the Army Air Forces in, in World War II. Um, and so we see by 1954, uh, when Congress is debating these subsidies for the helicopter airlines, it's this def national defense orientation uh, is continually pushed as uh, one of the key aspects for it. One of the more bizarre parts of the story uh, is um, relates to the rocket on rotor um, technology. Uh, and for those that uh, are unfamiliar with this, uh, this, this happened um, during the Korean War and uh, in 1952, Los Angeles Airways started uh, uh, acquiring its S-55s in preparation for passenger service. They had a uh, an internal capacity you could conceivably, uh, you know, cram, you know, eight passengers in the aircraft, but you could never get it off the ground. Uh, one of the ideas was to put a dome of uh, hydrogen peroxide above the rotor. And then you have um, you know stainless steel catalysts at the rotor tips that would convert that hydrogen peroxide to thrust, and you could have several minutes of greatly increased uh, rotor power. Uh, and this is an idea that Clarence Boleyn uh, at Los Angeles Airways was kind of dreaming up, and so he approached uh, Reaction Motors to kind of work on this, and then very quickly it got pushed over to the Marine Corps, who were desperate for that kind of capability in Korea. And while it was never actually deployed in Korea, it was tested quite significantly in 1954, 1955. And so there was a, another kind of bizarre <laughs> uh, a collaboration between the airlines and the military. Uh, in 1954, this kind of bizarre relationship reaches its apex when uh, the army is actually proposing that its new types get tested first in airline service. So the, there was a period where uh, the Army wanted to test its uh, H-37s um, in the skies over Los Angeles by having them, them operate as airliners uh, before that they would go into uh, full Army service so that the, uh, the bugs could be worked out, so to speak. That uh, obviously did not pass muster for a variety of reasons. Um, so um, as, as I'm wrapping up here, I think a couple other points I want to make about lessons that were learned uh, from the early days. One is infrastructure. Um, from the outset, there was a desire to have this, this type of urban rooftop infrastructure, that there be some sort of vertiport, you know, in the downtown area that could uh, serve as, as a nexus. They were never able to do that. Uh, even though uh, there was interest in it, they were never able to work the insurance or, uh, you know, get, get the facilities in place. Um, if we go back to 1944, you can see in New York, there was a, uh, a very ambitious conference that was held uh, by the, the Sixth Avenue Association to try and get to terms with what's involved in a uh, rooftop uh, heliport. Unfortunately, that early uh, 
kind of emphasis on trying to define infrastructure really did not um, bear fruition in any time any sort of industry organization really until about 1959. It's not until 1959 that there's any sort of significant effort to define industry standards for rooftop heliports. And for that reason, uh, it really languishes. And so the uh, helicopter airlines that were operating at sites outside of airports had really improvised facilities. So we see here, Los Angeles Airways was dealing with basically vacant lots and parking lots. Uh, so its most famous facility, of course, was the one at Disneyland, but even that was basically just a fenced off parking lot. Uh, and, you know, this this was as fancy as it ever got there at Disneyland, even though that was the most important uh, stop. Uh, even LAX had a pretty in, improvised uh, facility. Safety, of course, as Jim mentioned, was a huge concern. And Los Angeles Airways, unfortunately, had a fairly poor track record in the early 1950s. Uh, so they went through uh, most of their S-51s fairly quickly in mail service with some pretty prominent crashes. Uh, their very first S-55 they acquired for passenger service in 1952 before they got their passenger authorization. They, they had a brand new aircraft. They did a demonstration flight at the airport with the dignitaries, a lot of the senior management of the company, and then airport officials were on the aircraft and had a pretty horrific uh, hard landing. Uh, and, and most of the passengers were pretty severely injured. So we see even before the bad fatal crashes of uh, the 1960s that really, uh, 1968 that really ended it, uh, there were these other series of accidents early on that really kind of showed the immaturity and maybe a lack of attention to, to safety within the Los Angeles Airways culture. Uh, the, the final thing I want to end on today is, is kind of a fun project that shows maybe just how wacky things kind of got in the helicopter airlines and how uh, maybe, you know, they, they weren't keeping their eye on the ball because they, you know, they were so... Uh, focused on some of these other things that they did not pay attention to uh, those load factors and other economic considerations that were really necessary for them to be sustainable. So the wackiest one was the this one from 1965, which was called Project Sky Lounge. So Clarence Boleyn at LAA was quite taken with the Sikorsky Sky Crane that was in service, going into service in Vietnam at the time. And uh, the people pod that had been developed for the Army uh, was something that uh, Clarence Boleyn thought could be used to transport passengers in Los Angeles. And the idea was that you would uh, have this pod that could be lifted by helicopter, but then be driven around the streets of Los Angeles. So you could take your drunk tourists, you know, could pour out of their hotel uh, straight into a literal lounge. So it had a bar in it um, and, and they could could drink their way uh, to the uh, to the landing site where uh, the sky crane would pick it up and then they would uh, uh, land at LAX and then they'd be driven straight to the plane. And so you wouldn't have to rely on any conventional ground transportation. Uh, believe it or not, they actually got a million dollars from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, of all things, to actually work the study for this, uh, including the uh, building of a prototype uh, uh, sky lounge pod uh, with the Bud Company, which you can see here, and that was actually flown in 1967. Uh, of course, when this uh, study finally came out, um, it was deemed that you know it would be uh, at least twice and probably several times as expensive as any other form uh, of transport that one might get to the uh, airport. So, um, you know, kind of an absurd idea in hindsight, uh, but kind of a remarkable statement on on the whole story. LAA came to a very sad end uh, in the late 60s as the helicopter operation was starting to fall apart. Uh, they tried to get into stole planes and the idea was maybe uh, developing a, an array of stole strips because the twin otters would be easier to operate than the S-61s. That didn't get anywhere. Howard Hughes tried to rescue the company. That didn't go anywhere. Uh, the remnants were acquired by Golden West, but they couldn't make it work either and by 1972. Uh, the whole operation in Los Angeles had ended. And uh, I can go ahead and uh, conclude it on that point, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.
Uh, that was every bit as uh, fascinating as I thought it would be. Um, it, I, I think our audience sees the same thing. So many of our questions, uh, Dr. Connor, um, are related to how can we use what we have experienced in the past to uh, work better in the future? And so um, I guess the first one's not uh, from Bill. During the late 1960s, Congress killed the helicopter airline uh, industry subsidy. If it was still funded even on a limited basis, do you believe that that would have saved the helicopter uh, airlines? I, it's hard to see what equipment uh, that they could have had that would have been uh, acceptable over any sort of long term. Uh, I think the, you know, the interesting um, story, of course, is uh, SFO, which was unsubsidized and, and managed to operate until 1985. But they had a very specific geography. And I think that one key lesson here is that geography matters a lot, that uh, in if you have a certain environment, you know, with with, uh, you know, water obstruction or, or other elements that that are, um, you know, making ground transport more difficult, those are the areas that are most likely to be successful. And that wasn't always considered, uh, I think, when these helicopter services were proposed. There was a, a really strong push to have uh, a helicopter airline here in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, to go out to Dulles Airport as it was uh, wrapping up in the uh, 19, late 1950s. Uh, and of course, what wound up happening instead was that the Dulles Toll Road was built. So, uh, you know, that uh, the, the competition with the uh, ground transport always has to be considered. And just 70 short years later, we'll have the silver line that will take us uh, from uh, downtown out there on uh, Metro. Um, from Peter, is uh, if the vertiport infrastructure was so problematic in the past, is there a way that these eVTOL operators can overcome these challenges with the addition of an electric infrastructure issues? I think one of the, the that's an interesting question, of course, the, the fire suppression aspect of having a lot of uh, uh, kerosene or, or F fuel on board is, is you know, one factor that makes the EV toll so much more attractive. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's also the, the kind of load factor of, of rooftop facilities. And the I think the interesting thing in Los Angeles was that we only saw the profusion of rooftop heliports in Los Angeles after Los Angeles Airways died. And that profusion of heliports was due to the fact that there have been some pretty nasty high rise fires uh, in the late 60s, early 70s that prompted the fire code basically to make uh, uh, rooftop heliports part of uh, high rise construction in Los Angeles. Uh, because of this, you know, uh, uh, towering inferno kind of scenario that uh, drove a lot of concerns. And I think it's it's those kind of supplemental, you know, public safety aspects that that can often be a deciding factor in in, uh, you know, making the case for having that rooftop infrastructure. But other, otherwise, uh, if you're putting the entire burden on an unsubsidized type of in infrastructure, I think it's very hard to get that buy in. Uh, to, to build sufficient infrastructure to make the network viable. I uh, see a question from uh, Ken uh, in the chats. There was an FAA NASA initiative in the late 60s and early 70s to support ESTOL uh, port development. Was that seen as a successor to the helicopter airlines or were those separate developments? Uh, so we uh, we see the the... And particularly, it comes back in the '80s as well. Uh, there's, you know, this big push in the '80s, uh, you know, kind of once the the tilt rotors in full development um, as well. And I think the NASA studies uh, tended to be, you know, a, a bit more hypothetical. I think there was a, you know, a, a looking at okay, can we, you know, if we expand the the horizon out a bit more and you know make this a bit more regional rather than interurban, uh, can we make this model work? And I think that's that was what you're seeing in, in some of those studies. But uh, of course, there wasn't a, a VTOL aircraft at that time that could have, you know, fit that function. The uh, There was the ferry rotodyne of the, the 50s and 60s that was, that was actively considered, particularly by New York Airways. 
but the the noise and cost issues associated with that were really a, a non-starter even then. Uh, we have a question from Juliet Page, who has uh, been a frequent uh, contributor on our webinars. She uh, has worked previously for the NASA Volpe Center doing noise research. Her question is, it's been noted that one of the major considerations for advanced air mobility to succeed is that it needs to be quiet enough that it's barely noticeable above the background noises. Can you talk about the effect of helicopter noise and community complaints historically on the lack of success for civil helicopter operations? And are there any lessons to be learned there? So uh, I mentioned that 1959 uh, kind of conference that was held in Los Angeles, and that was really the first time that I, I encountered any attempt to create kind of consistent standards, uh, particularly on noise. So they were actually, you know, presenting papers at that time, essentially kind of outlining, you know, here's what we see as, as kind of the, the threshold for, for what's acceptable, what's not, and, and trying to provide some standards. So that really does not come in until fairly late. And, you know, as I mentioned, it's one of the things that was, a, it was definitely a factor in the 1968 closure of the uh, Pan Am heliport. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, it was something that was really left off the table far too long, I think for, for the helicopter airlines. And from what I can tell, it, it, it wasn't a huge factor in, in their operating sites in the 1950s. Uh, but clearly, um, you know, that was only going to be a, a, a much bigger problem as time went on. If, if these services has, had stayed in effect because the, the sites that they had picked for their heliports were increasingly encroached on by development. Uh, I'm going to zoom. There's a couple of questions that kind of deal with the same thing. So I'm going to try to bring it into just one. Um, in your consideration, have you experienced or thought about any particular model of advanced air mobility that, um, that you feel like has the greatest chances of success? Um, you know, in moving people either in New York or Los Angeles, Chicago, places like that. It's a good question. I I don't have an answer to that. I think the uh, the challenge obviously is the throughput on aircraft that are, you know, four or five passenger, um, you know, to, to make any sort of dent, um, you know, the numbers of aircraft involved have to be astronomical. So that, that in itself seems to be a pretty significant challenge. Uh, I guess the other question is, um, you know, what, what is the, uh, you know, advantage, uh, relative to surface transport, you know, if, if we're, you know, if we have one large vertiport in a downtown area, you know, you're still reliant to a great degree on, on surface transport. Um, so how many, how many of those vertiports do you have to have in a downtown area before it becomes practical to, to make that sort of uh, investment? And, you know, I think those are, those are the key questions that, that kind of uh, jump to my mind. So I'll wrap it up with one final question on my mind. Um, it seems like building public perception, positive public perception is going to be a, a key factor. I know that uh, Uber would have had us believe that they could do a port to port. It almost sounds like a, a hub to spoke system is gonna be more practical. Is that something that uh, you think the public would still buy into? I think it's a, it's a good question. And certainly, um, you know, the helicopter airlines really never were able to establish a model outside of the uh, uh, international airport and and uh, terminus, and I think whatever is going to have work it needs to needs to uh, you know have have a ha it needs to have a broader network structure, and I I would think that the uh, cargo uh, UAV market is a much more likely to be successful in the short term or, you know, as a, as a niche entry point uh, for the technology, just because you can start to uh, connect some regional facilities that uh, might otherwise be obstructed by limitations in the ground network. And I think, you know, it, in this case, it might behoove the industry to start small rather than trying to have uh, something that's gonna work as a, uh, as a human transportation network um, that's just not, simply not scalable.
Okay, well, Dr. Connor, um, I, I think we might have to try and have you back on at some point. Uh, the audience engagement uh, has started to really pick up. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of interest in your topic. Unfortunately, we are out of time today. So please allow me to express my uh, deepest gratitude for you, uh, to you for your time today and setting up uh, the webinar. Um, I think that uh, this has been fascinating. And I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Much appreciated. Okay, well, let me go ahead and uh, wrap things up now. Uh, share my screen here. Okay, for those of you who have been uh, regular attendees of our webinars, we are changing our schedule. We are now looking at uh, doing uh, bi-monthly webinars. Um, we had a significant problem trying to get presenters uh, to commit now that COVID's uh, coming to an end. And so uh, we found that uh, picking just two a month instead of four or five a month is going to be much more practical. So please look for our webinars on the second and fourth uh, Thursdays of every month. Uh, a couple of upcoming topics. Um, the first one I, that's coming up next, uh, July 28th, I know has always been a very interesting topic for our business owners, our helicopter operators, a lot of the pilots. Uh, a helicopter and industry insurance update. Um, we have a speaker from the Aviation Insurance Association, uh, Jim Gardner, who has been on previously. He'll be joining us again, and we'll be able to make a presentation and answer questions. On August 11th, another issue that's uh, of extreme importance to our industry, uh, workforce development. Uh, the HAA Board of Directors uh, has just announced a creation of a workforce development working group. If you have interest in uh, joining that working group, if you have experience in workforce development, uh, please see Rotor Daily today. Uh, we just posted a story on uh, how to join that working group. And we're looking for, I think, 30 volunteers from across the industry and uh, education to join that group. Uh, looking forward to uh, all those upcoming webinars. Uh, we do have a uh, questionnaire that will be coming out to you very, very shortly. We do ask that you take a few minutes to uh, share your thoughts with us, what you enjoyed about today's webinar, what you thought could be uh, improved. Uh, more importantly, if you have ideas for future webinars, we're always looking for good ideas. HAI, of course, is a member-based organization. We do absolutely want input on what we can do better to improve our services to the industry or on behalf of the industry. If you have any thoughts on something like that, please let Jim Viola know directly. Uh, easiest way to do that is send him an email at president at rotor.org. That email is there at the bottom. He uh, does pay attention to every email that comes into that address. He does task uh, the staff with uh, responding to those if he doesn't do it himself. That does wrap up our webinar today. We appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedule to uh, watch it. Uh, we look forward to having you join us again on webinars in the future. Until then, we ask that you be safe and that you fly safe.